Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is David Farrell. I'm a professor of politics at University College Dublin, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar today, which is co-organized by the IIEA and the European Parliament Liaison Office in Ireland. The Conference on the Future of Europe is an historic EU-wide exercise in citizens' engagement. It provides an opportunity for citizens across the European Union to participate in a dialogue with politicians at national and EU level on plans for the future of the European Union. Now we're in the latter stages of the conference with the very last meeting of the citizens panels um, taking place in Dublin this coming weekend. This, this of course is deeply symbolic because Ireland is internationally recognized uh, as a leader in promoting the use of deliberative processes like this. So I'm particularly pleased um, that, that we will be having that event here. So my job is to, first of all, introduce everyone, say a little bit about the running order, and then let us get started with the, with the process. What I'm going to do is I'll first introduce each of the panelists before they make their initial remarks. And we've asked each panelist to try and confine their remarks to between five and seven minutes, ideally, to give us enough time for discussion. Once they've concluded, we will go straight to a discussion and question and answer session. And so I would ask you to submit any questions you may have via the Zoom Q&A function that you see down at the bottom right of your screen. If you type in your questions there, we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have. So let me introduce the three members of the European Parliament that we're, I'm delighted to, to have um, with us for this panel today. Uh, this is the order in which we will run this, the session. So we'll start with Colin Markey, who has represented the Midlands Northwest constituency for Fine Gael since 2020, and currently serves on the Agricultural and Rural Development Committee. Before becoming an MEP, he was a member and former chair of Louth County Council and the former president of the Irish Youth Farmer Association, Macrina Fermer. He currently runs the Louth Leadership Partnership for SMEs and runs a family farm in Tucker County, Louth. Then we'll be followed by Laurence Ferreng, who is a French MEP representing the Mouvement Democrat since 2019. She is also a regional councillor for the Nouvelle Aquitaine region in France. She was formerly a local councillor and the former director of communication events and protocol for the city of Pau. She is the Renew Europe's group's coordinator for the culture and education committee of the European Parliament and a member of the European Parliament's delegation to the conference on the future of Europe, as well as the founder of the Bonjour Europe initiative, facilitating youth placements uh, in cities and universities across Europe. And then last but not least, Josiane Kutajar is a Maltese MEP representing the Labour Party there since 2019. She is the Vice Chair of the European Parliament Delegation for Relations with Australia and New Zealand and a member of the Industry, Energy and Research Committee with a focus on digital policy and the single market. Before becoming an MEP, Ms Kutajar worked in the office of the Prime Minister of Malta, working on issues of equal gender representation, domestic and gender based violence. So just to remind everyone that um, today's address, discussion and Q&As are all being recorded, so they're all open and public. Please feel free to join in the discussion on Twitter. If you like, you can use the handles at IIEA or at EP in Ireland to try and help make sure that everyone can see all the tweets. And we are also live streaming today's discussion, so I want to give a special warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. So I'd like to invite the panellists to start with their brief remarks, and I'll start with you, Colin. Thank you very much, David. And as you say, it's, it's, it's timely to have this event this week with the citizens, assembly, uh, citizens panel at the weekend. And I suppose, as you say, it's modelled in a lot of ways on the citizens' assemblies we've had here in Ireland over the years. And I think we've had a good track record in terms of the outcomes of them. And I think one of the key things about the outcomes of them was the mere citizen engagement got people interacting in the conversation and if you like evolve the conversation as to where things could go and I think it should be the same at European level because uh, there, there, there's certainly a, a concern if you like about it concerns of a disconnect if you like certainly if you're over in Brussels and you see how much disconnected sometimes the ordinary people are on the ground to policy and the development of policy and in times that can lead to, to a bit of apathy and in a world where sort of media is if you like it, it changing forms of media that are out there and uh, if you like it's gone to a world where people more reinforce their opinions rather than challenge their opinions. And I think something like this gives us the opportunity to challenge those opinions. 
And I suppose the other thing about it is the context that we're in at the minute is, is very important. Like when you consider we've just come out of the pandemic, we had Brexit before that, which if you like challenged many things about Europe and where Europe is going. And then we, with our current scenario on our Eastern borders, what's happening there. So we've all that going on or have gone on over the last couple of years. And then to all of that, we have a backdrop of our climate challenge, which is going to really put a many strains in many ways in terms of how we, how we can achieve that over the years. So just to, to touch on it, I suppose, briefly, as you say, some of the key issues I would see that are there that we really need to focus on. Obviously, the, the one that I mentioned there in relation to the security side of it, like when you look at the situation in Ukraine, what's developing, it, it, it asks the question, how are we meant to deal with that into the future? How are we meant to deal with aggression, if you like, on the world stage? And also, if you look at a scenario where in more recent years, I suppose, US foreign policy has been taken a step back and you, you, you ask what, is there a vacuum there? How is it to be fulfilled? I suppose here in Ireland, we'd very much value our defence policy, uh, or sorry, our, our neutrality policy, should I say, and uh, the, the part we played in terms of a, of a peacekeeper on the world stage and neutrality has been very strong from an Irish perspective. And I suppose the question is then, how does that sit with European defence? And I know there's a conversation in certain places as regards to the European army. And that's one that certainly would be a, a challenging conversation here in Ireland. And the whole Ukrainian thing then leads, I think a lot of these things are interconnected. The Ukrainian thing leads to the question as regards or the, the scenario with Russia leads to the question in relation to our security of our energy supply, and in particular our gas supply, obviously. And what our options are in terms of, if you like, do we need to wean ourselves off that that security from 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 the east? And I think that's that that is a, a major concern. And then brings into focus, if you like, other things around that we were discussing, the likes of taxonomy that we're discussing at the moment in terms of alternative energy sources. Like and there, there's very like very what would have been difficult questions that we would have talked about in the past around nuclear and about a uh, uh, liquid natural gas and things like that. But equally in an Irish context, we have a massive opportunity in terms of offshore wind. So how we how we I suppose the idealism at one level of um, the ambition to a uh, to greener environment, a. Uh, and people on the other side of that argument will talk about a practical approach, I suppose, and how we make that, that, that ambition in terms of the environment, how we practically deliver it. But in the current climate, we've probably the cold realities of how we have to make that tangible. And that, that's really going to be a, a challenge. I think that leads, like the energy question leads into our, into our environmental question where we're looking to decarbonize the environment as well. So like that, 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 that the, like to, to replace the energy to take the carbon out of our environment, like in transport, like heavy goods, vehicles, aviation, a, a, a maritime transport. These are all big challenges that we have. And I think how we, we intend to, to deal with these. And one thing that I see with this, that it leads on to interconnecting with that again is, is like, if you like, our food systems. And if you like, an old issue that we would have talked about for years would be our, our food security. And I know that's an old issue, but but in a way, when you look at the current scenario where, like, we have to recognise that uh, the production of food impacts on our environment. And if you like, global warming impacts on our potential to produce food. And equally, um, if we seek to decarbonise our food production systems, that impacts on the use of fertilisers and things. And that in itself can can have an impact on, on food supplies. So, so all, the, all the interactions of, let's say, our security, our energy supply, our environment, and, and even our food production system, where, where really we're looking at, a, if you like, a, the interlinks of a, a food systems approach, I think, is something that, that started into the conversation in more recent years, where we include the likes of food, uh, food policy with environment policy and with health policy, where you integrate all three together, because the three are so interlinked. And I think, Going forward, that food systems approach is something that we're going to have to think a lot about. I suppose other key areas then, like I mentioned at the start, post-pandemic, what Europe can do in health is something that's, that's come into focus as well in terms of, I suppose, we saw the response to the COVID pandemic, whether it be the, 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 the rollout of the vaccines and how Europe invested in that. And by, by working together, OK, it was a little bit slow initially, but certainly the capacity for smaller countries like Malta or like Ireland to, to benefit from that, from the, from the collective purchase and the collective rollout of that, uh, was very important. And equally, 
the pooling resources in terms of the research capacity and the digital certificate, all those things are things that, uh, that uh, Europe played a major part in. And I suppose the question going forward then is, in the area of medicine, can we can we play a part? Like particularly, I think in the area of preventative medicine, is there something we can do there in relation to it? Certainly in the research space and in the vaccine space and in the mental health space. Like we're obviously not well. I don't think we're going to set up any European A and E like emergency response. But but in the preventative medicine space, in the research space, perhaps there's a lot Europe can do. And I think these are some of the key areas. Look, to just. I could keep going on. I don't know. Maybe if you if you want me to wrap up with that, there is one or two other ones. Obviously, digital transformation, the businesses, young people. These are all areas that are so so important. Maybe we'll come up to them better in the questions, and and I'll leave it at that for the minute, just as a, as a kickoff. Thank you, Colin, and thank you very much for keeping the time. I really am grateful for that. There's a lot to say, as you say, so thank you for keeping it uh, confined. Um, and just to remind everyone, if you have any questions, do please put them into the Q and A. We'll keep an eye on them as this proceeds. So I'll turn to Laurence next. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Farrell, and thank you uh, to the Institute for inviting me today. I'm really delighted to be here to exchange on the conference uh, on the future of Europe with everybody that's, uh, who is connected, and uh, I'm pleased to, to meet my colleagues as well. Um, thank you for introducing me. I am indeed a French member of the European Parliament in the Renew Europe uh, political group. First, I would like to say a few words on me. I come, as you said, from Pau. Uh, it's a city in the very southwest of France, close to the mountains. And in the European Parliament, I am coordinator for my, my group, Renew Europe, in the call committee. To give you an example of what my work uh, there looks like, uh, in 2020, I negotiated the new Erasmus Plus program for the period of 2021-2027. And you know that, that these programs are for seven years. Uh, so it's very important to, 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 uh, to, to have the good decision on it. My uh, priorities in the process were to secure a stronger global budget for this successful uh, European program and to ensure a greater inclusion of participants. Uh, regarding the conference on the future of Europe, I'm glad to see that many talks in the two first sessions of the panel one show once again how these uh, mobility programs are for citizens milestones of the European Union. As you mentioned it, uh, this weekend citizens panel number one will meet in Dublin Castle and work on their final recommendation regarding the three last white topics, which are the one on economy, social justice and employment, the one on the digital transition, and the one I am the most familiar with, education, youth, culture and sport. The last, uh, this last citizens panel will mark a very important moment of the conference as it marks the start of the next step for us, members of the conference plenary, which will be to discuss these recommendations and build concrete proposals. I can tell you that I'm really looking forward to read this citizens' uh, recommendation, giving how interesting are our exchanges with the citizens in our working groups of the plenary. With the uh, final recommendation, we will be able to reach a next step in this unique process. As prelim preliminary uh, remarks, there are two points about this conference with, that I would like to share with you. The conference of the future of Europe is truly a major unique exercise of citizens' participation at the European level. As a member of the European Parliament part of this uh, Renew Europe family, I was proud to see that my political group has done so much for this large scale participation e exercise to exist. Because for the first time, the three European institutions are putting citizen, citizens in the center, enabling them to have a strong voice in the future of our European policies. With the launch of the platform, of the digital platform, every citizen could contribute, share an idea, build an event, and connect with other European citizens, no matter where they live in Europe. 
To me, it's a crucial point. Coming from a city in France that is not Paris, but a medium-sized city close to Spain, I, I always fought for a fair representation of all citizens coming from rural or urban areas or different backgrounds. We face different challenges, specific questions, and they should be heard as well. Second point that I find uh, very crucial with the Conference of the Future of Europe is to involve the younger generation. And the citizens' panels reflect this need, with one third of citizens being aged between 16 and 25, young people are given the priority. And to be included in the European process, to be consulted on the European Union is what they want. Uh, according to the Youth Survey 2021, around three out of five respondents, it's uh, 62%, are generally in favor of the European Union and the 2019 European election saw a significant mobilization at the ballot box for the younger generation with a jump of uh, uh, 14 points among the under 55 years old. However, they are calling for new form of participation in the democratic process, in addition to the traditional vote, which would be more concrete and bring more results more quickly. A few recommendations from the panel on democracy and values reflect this wish. To me, it's all linked to our common European identity. This European identity is complex as the core of it is our diversity and this European spirit might seem abstract because it passes through experiences. I think this is why, and this is what the, you, the program Erasmus has shown. Hence, to me, they are first to, le to leads that European Union should build on for younger, young generation to be part of the project and embrace it. This is mobility and participation, and I am happy to see that in the, the last stages of the conference, this is what citizens were calling for, openness and more Europe. Of course, there are many other interesting points and inputs from citizens to talk, and I will be very happy to develop on them with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And again, thank you for keeping to time. No pressure, Yossian, because you're the last one. And um, I turn the floor to you now. Thank you very much, David, and thanks to the Institute for the invite and this initiative, as well as the European Union Liaison Office in, in Ireland here. You do very important work, and it's great to come together and discuss the upcoming conference and also in, in the wake of, of the panel taking place in, in Dublin this weekend. It's a true pleasure indeed to be also discussing in, when it comes to important aspects related also to the aspects of panel one. And as anticipated earlier, my focus in my line of work, one of the focuses is precisely digitalization. I work on digital files, both in the ITRA committee, but also in the TRAN committee where I've worked on various opinions. And I take you also through some uh, uh, points I've put forward also for this debate. First of all, the recommendations from panel from the panel will in fact be very much important because they'll be feeding into the work of the Digital Transformation Working Group, which I do form part in this process of the conference uh, plenary. And then we could also formulate some concrete proposals which take into account these suggestions to be approved then in the final plenary. The European Union, as we know, is striving to be the world leader when it comes to digitalization, also through its regulation. And the work we're conduct conducting in the institutions could really have an effect on the remaining part of the world. We know that Europe is trying to ensure that fundamental values and rights of our union are respected in the digital domain, and I really hope that we will lead by example here. From human rights to freedom of expression and the right to privacy to principles paramount for our single market, 
these are all very much important that we preserve and work more at home. What is illegal offline must be illegal online. Maybe this is a phrase that you've heard and it's something which the EU and the institutions are striving towards. Even the European Parliament in its various reports is striving towards. And indeed, Europe is trying to do this. And this is something which we really believe in. There are plenty of digital initiatives that the European Union and its institutions are putting forward. And I would really like to touch upon some of these. From the experience with, throughout this process of the conference, we've seen how even through certain recommendations being put forward by the citizens, they are putting forward certain values, certain principles, which are already being reflected in certain legislative initiatives. And therefore, I wanted to also address a bit, maybe a knowledge gap, which may exist between what is known in Brussels and the immediate institutions and what is known to the public. I wanted, to, therefore, to touch upon some legislation which we're working upon at the moment. The Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act have received quite some media attention. But it's important to also underline here and recap that the Digital Services Act, which we refer to as the DSA in short, aims at regulating online platforms and their content. And here the final work from Parliament contains very important provisions on protecting consumers from illegal content and on banning dark patterns. What are dark patterns? Dark patterns refer to tricks used in websites and apps that make you do things that you don't mean to, like buying or signing up for something, and we need to address these. The most important provision for me then is a, a very important point which is at heart. We need to protect all vulnerable citizens, including our children. And indeed, our legislation, our proposed piece of legislation is insisting on the importance of a ban on collection of data from minors to conduct targeted advertising. Then the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, it aims at improving competition and restoring fair markets. It is aimed at big players in the sense that it regulates certain abuses or dominance which could happen by big players, which may not allow smaller players, including SMEs, to come forth within the market. We really need a new market which is open to everyone to reach their potential, including our small and medium-sized enterprises. I work a lot on SMEs policy, even in the HR committee, and I really believe that there's a huge potential in the digital field also for our SMEs. We want to ensure that EU businesses are not stifled when trying to enter or succeed within the EU market. Improving competition means also improving the customer experience and the customer's choice in reality. We want to allow consumers to have choice and fair prices. I personally looked also at the Digital Markets Act from a tourism perspective. Trust me when I say that we need legislation of the sort to protect our European businesses and maintain the diversity present in the EU markets. The DSA and the MA are now currently being negotiated in trilogues under the guidance of the French presidency. The EU is also moving forward when it comes to regulating the use of artificial intelligence. We know how AI is spreading and we need to have clear rules in place to ensure that there, are, there is protection, but also incentiv incentivizing businesses to develop in this field. Again, a first in the world. Again, we are drawing attention to the other continents. To make it brief, the EU wants to take a risk-based approach to AI to ensure that safety and human rights come first. AI will benefit our society, but must be deployed carefully. And we must have clear rules in this field. Think about, for example, facial recognition, recognition technology or social scoring. There are risks associated and we really need to address them. Here I am working more from the transport and tourism side of things as also the reporter on the socialist behalf and the committee of the transport and tourism. 
and it's important that we push forward a strong legislation. Then there are other important aspects. In the ITRA committee, we're working also as shadow reporter in my case on the policy program of the path towards the digital decades. We hear a lot when it comes to the environmental targets which European Union is putting forward, important targets that we need to achieve whilst making sure that we leave no one behind when it comes to the different segments of our society, when it comes to our vulnerable citizens, but also vulnerable regions. And we need to make sure that we leave no one behind when it comes to member states, irrespective of whether they are small or large, whether they are central on the continent or our islands or beyond. And therefore, this is very important even when it comes to digitalization and its targets. We need to work with member states and the stakeholders and have an ambitious program. We are putting targets for 2030, similar to the targets in the sense that we have targets of the Green Deal for the environmental aspect, but also we're putting forward targets for the digital aspect. And in this regard, I look forward to working with the stakeholders to put forward ambitious targets, not to leave our businesses behind, our SMEs, but also our citizens. We need to look at basic skills, basic skills which are essential as the world has shifted more online, as the services have shifted even more online during the pandemic, including basic services, and make sure even when it comes to public sector services that will have the digitalization in place. The recently published proposal for an interinstitutional European Declaration on Digital Rights and Principles is also an important initiative to mention. With some colleagues who are calling to strengthen the text to avoid a missed opportunity, we need a stronger call. We need a charter of digital rights within the EU, and we need to look even, I stress, even beyond. There are some digital rights which we should consider as human rights, including when it comes to the access of the internet as a human right. We know that the internet is no longer a necessity, but it is a must. And therefore, it's not, I'm sorry, it's no longer a luxury, but it is, an, it is a necessity and it's a must. And therefore we need enablers first and foremost. We need enablers of connectivity, of skills, and of recognizing stronger rights and giving them a stronger status to make sure that we get there. The pandemic has taught us how important internet accessibility is, as I said. And indeed, this is a long process when I speak of human rights, of recognizing certain, certain digital rights as a human right, but we need to start working towards this process. I hope that from what I have explained today, it may be clear a bit to the citizens what the EU is doing from a digital perspective. What is key to underline is also that from the proposals which have been put forward in the preliminary outcome from panel one, citizens have been putting forward requests on issues that the EU is in some respect already taking action on. Just as an example, an orientation is on a new legislation for online advertising and the DSA which we've been working upon is already presenting some text calling for the ban on targeted advertising, for example. I won't comment much at the stage when it comes to the plenary outcome from panel one, but I wanted to quickly pick up on some important points which were put forward. I really like the concept of democratization of digitalization. And to do this, digitalization must be really accessible to everyone. It calls for school curricula to teach digital skills from an early age, or the call to fight harmful content and speech online. All very important principles which you must take on board and continue fighting upon and working upon in the European Union. The point I am making is that the recommendation, recommendations from panel one are also promising with their suggestions, and I really cannot wait to read the final ones. I look forward also to analyzing them within the Digital Transformation Working Group at the conference plenary, and I look forward to the Q&A which ensues. Thank you very much and thanks to all who joined us.
Thank you, Josiane, and thank you to all three contributors for some fascinating contributions. I was scribbling notes while I was listening to you, and we have Colm talking about security in a number of different dimensions, not just militarily, but also in terms of uh, foreign policy, energy, environment, food security. Security was a very strong theme that I got from you. Laurent started from the Erasmus, that wonderful Erasmus scheme, and the, and the whole theme of mobility, and particularly its impact on our younger citizens, and that then went to a a really nice discussion I thought about what we can do to help our younger generation and not least the demands of our younger generation for new forms of participation. And then uh, Yosian, you were talking about your particular prominent theme of, of digitalization and, and how that affects questions to do with human rights and freedom of expression more generally. Um, you discussed at uh, the Digital um, Services Act, you discussed the possibility of a charter of digital rights and the theme of artificial intelligence. So we've got a really rich feast of different themes that each of you have brought to the, to the feast. And so I, I guess I could just start, and actually let me just interrupt myself before I start with my question, just to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A now. We already have one, but I would like a few more. And if possible, tell us your affiliation and your name as well, so we know who we're talking to. But my question, I want to go first of all to all three panelists with, with the same question based on this rich feast that you've introduced to us. What are your expectations for this weekend? What are your expectations for the conference on the future of Europe generally? Is it going to make a difference? And, and, and let me be a little bit more precise. Do you envisage treaty reforms? And if there are not treaty reforms, has this been a waste of time? So. I'm trying to be a wee bit provocative just to get the discussion going, but let me go in the same order as we started with um, Colm. You're, you're mute. I don't know is the answer. I wouldn't be so sure one way or the other. I think uh, definitely we do need a meaningful engagement. And I wonder if, if, if to date we've had that. And certainly I think there's a need to, to, to get that level of engagement. And, and I suppose it's not just about treaty change, it's also about policy in different areas that can be acted on uh, within leg legislation, within the parliament or, or, or the like. But I do wonder, are we getting enough of a meaningful engagement with the, with the citizens on the ground? And I think it's critical that we do. And I think, I think we have to ask a question about like where it'll go in terms of, in terms of Treaty change, I suppose, what that would look like and and what the, the various, like most of what's been talked about has been the detail of, of, we'll say, be it climate policy or be it digital transition or things like that, uh, various things like that. And I don't know that that it necessarily has engaged today to the level that it needs to, to really, like, if you ask the ordinary person on the street, are they engaged with the conference in the future of Europe? I don't know if they are or not. And, it's not that I'm being critical of it, but I think the challenge is on us all to make sure that there's meaningful engagement and we have to go back again to have further engagement. I think it's very important. Where that goes in terms of policy, I think there, there's a lot more to it than treaty change. And I think there's a lot can be achieved just in terms of work plans and initiatives and direction of travel in terms of the environment, in terms of the digital piece, in terms of the young people. Uh, so, it, as I say, there's multi, it's multifaceted, but my underlying concern is how are, are we talking to ourselves or are we talking to the public? And I have a concern that we're ultimately not talking to the public enough in this. Okay, slightly, slightly pessimistic then. Laurence. Thank you very much. Of course, as a pure Euro, European uh, group, we have big hope with the conference. And it's a very uh, difficult way because we, we have to reach a big agreement uh, between all the institutions and the three, three institutions. So what's happening at the, uh, the citizen level is one thing. It's very important because as I said, it's the first time that, uh, that a so huge consultation is happening. So it's very important that every citizen after the Brexit, after this wave of populism, uh, has the occasion to have a reflection altogether about what Europe can really deliver. So I think this point is very, uh, is the plus, is very important. Um, and 
we will see what will happen uh, this weekend, but we have uh, already the conclusion of the first panel. And as you mentioned, there are a, a big challenge with uh, uh, the, uh, the treaties because we had the, the, this panel about democracy. Of, of course, the unanimity rule is a big challenge. So uh, all, uh, all of us and uh, in the parliament, and uh, I see my colleague were not in line on this topic, but uh, I am profoundly uh, in favor because we can go further without this, uh, uh, we, without reopening the treaty when it comes to for, of rule of law, uh, of budget and so on. And we see we are very in a very crucial moment with all the risks that uh, are on Europe, uh, on security, uh, after the crisis, and so on. So um, I'm having big hope. I'm, I'm not sure really of what is going to happen because I think the, the parliament will in majority be in favor of uh, going further. But uh, what can we wait um, of the council? I'm not sure. I know there are very big issues uh, at the time we are talking about uh, uh, the question of finance, of uh, rule of law, of course. Um, so I'm not sure of what is going to happen, but uh, we have made a big progress with the, this uh, process of the conference, because now we need to 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 deliver for citizens and what they will say we have to, to hear it huh? and to i think that will it we can stop in may huh? we can stop in may we have to do it again and to 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 have this consultation uh, in the in the in the in the future I'm sorry for my for my poor english but i hope it's understandable for you so i think we haven't won yet sure it's difficult. Uh, I think there are um, the discussions are very interesting because uh, when we see uh, elections after election in all the countries, we see the right of the populist. But when you hear from the citizens, it's really different. They want more Europe. They want us to be more harmonized. So it's you know, it it shows that we have to reflect together and to have. Um, uh, more intelligence maybe in the democracy. So that's my point of view. I think, uh, as I said, it's a progress, it's a big hope, and then we'll see. Thank you. Thank you, Laurence. We shall certainly see. Uh, Josiane. For sure, I do look forward to the recommendations which will answer you from uh, the citizens' panels. As to the way forward, we still have to wait a bit, but yes, there's the question of the treaty change, and we do have specific rules when it comes to treaty change in the, in the treaties. However, there could be other initiatives, as my colleagues here have stipulated, that we could take. There could be funding programs, which will come in line also with the citizens' priorities. There could also be a legislative change through the ordinary legislative procedure, for example. But beyond that, is this exercise an important one? Is it a valid one? Let me start by stating that I really wish that it could be given more media attention because I really feel that there's not enough media attention to this. Secondly, for me, it would really be effective if we really manage to um, reach more of our citizens. And when I speak of reaching the citizens, it's not only those who are online, but also those who do not have the skills or who do not have the digital equipment to connect. It is reaching those who are your skeptics and not only those who are in favor of the EU. Because in reality, we need to listen to everyone and we need to engage with everyone. And this is a really important point for me. And in my also discussions I have with my citizens, I try to discuss a bit this pro process that we are undergoing together. I really also believe that we should take lessons from this process for future consultations that we embark upon as a European Union. And here I wanted to share one example. Um, the Socialists and Democrats at a conference in Malta 
some, some months ago. And within this conference, we also discussed certain important issues and certain important suggestions, inviting various youth coming from different backgrounds. And I mentioned here a proposal from a citizen. His name is Jean. Jean is wheelchair bound, but is very and is a very active youth. And he mentioned the fact, for example, that the website of the conference and the online platform should be more interactive, even, even for example, when it comes to speech to text mechanisms and applications and other important aspects. So I really believe that through this process, if we've come across even certain feedback, which may not necessarily have been implemented in this process, we should implemented in future consultations to come. Because at the end of the day, that's the effectiveness of it, the proposals received, the feedback received when it comes even to how the process worked, shouldn't stop with the end of this process, but should continue also beyond with regards to other consultations we will make as a European Union in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, we have uh, about seven or eight minutes before we have to conclude the discussion. So if it's acceptable, I might just um, throw a question at each one of you um, and, and see how we go with that. So perhaps if I could start with you, Laurence, um, given, the, given the role that the, that the French president has played in promoting this kind of approach to engagement and dialogue with citizens in France very prominently in recent times, and given the fact that you are facing into presidential elections in France, can I ask, is there, is, there, is there much interest being played in the Conference of the Future of Europe and the, particularly this, these citizens' panels in the French debate? Are there lessons being learned for how this could be further implemented in your country? Uh, you know, unfortunately, when you have a, a, a domestic discussion and politics, it's, it's bigger than all. So um, what I have to underline and to mention is that, uh, of course, uh, the French government has had a lot of initiatives uh, about the conference. So we had, um, just before the process, big regional consultations in all our reg region in, in France so uh, that we were able to uh, listen to all the citizens of all the region with all the differences. And it has been treated in a report. So uh, as a French MEP from the majority, we, we had them. And it's, you know, the conclusion were really interesting. But I shared the point of uh, Josiane that uh, we not need more media. It's the same thing in France. Uh, uh, French people hear a lot uh, of the French presidency. And unfortunately, because we have the, the, the issue with uh, the, the Ukraine and the crisis that is uh, on, ongoing, but um, we are very much hearing about that. Maybe, you know, the speech in the plenary uh, of uh, President Macron was um, very hard in France. The first time that we see the, the European Parliament at French TV, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. But um, it's bigger than the conference. We, we really have a, uh, an issue with it at the European level, of course. I, I absolutely share this point because, uh, because it's new, maybe. Yeah? Uh, only and, and we have to, to, to install this form of uh, uh, direct uh, participation, uh, direct democratic participation. But I think when uh, I have organized in my small city, I've organized a panel and I had a lot of uh, people coming to, to, and they had a lot of idea about uh, things we never speak about when, when you have a public debate. Because when, as uh, uh, my colleague Com uh, mentioned, when you talk about uh, climate change, when you talk about security, when you talk about agriculture, of course, it interests everybody and the or digital issue. So um, uh, my answer is no, <laughs> but uh, we, we see that when you create space of the debate, it works. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. It's for, for somebody who is a big promoter of deliberative approaches involving citizens, it's wonderful to hear what is going on in, in your country and particularly to hear your local initiative in your city of Pau. Um, we have had some questions. And so what I was going to do, perhaps, if this is all right, is direct a question uh, at the remaining panelists, because I think this will bring us to the end of the time. So, uh, Josiane, I was going to ask you one of uh, the questions from uh, um, Dara Lawler, who is an economics researcher from the IIEA. You may have seen the question yourself. Do you believe the conference should consider the possibility of treaty changes? Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, it's the wrong one. It's the other one because we've already asked that one. Do you think the par parliament should have a larger role in the formation of policy in the EU, given that you come from the European Parliament? It would be interesting to hear your perspective on that. And yeah, if so, yeah. how should that be addressed by the conference? So um, when it comes to a stronger role of the European Parliament and several of uh, the resolutions being put forward by the European Parliament and therefore by the MEPs voting upon it, there are always these clauses asking for a stronger role of the European Parliament. The European Parliament is directly elected institutions but by the citizen and therefore has an important weight in this regard. Having said that, we know that Treaty change requires also unanimity and there are certain competencies which also uh, belong to the member states. But having said this, it's also a true fact that the European Parliament can put pressure and influence even when there are exclusive competences falling under the member states. With regards to whether this should be linked to the, um, in relation to the Conference of the Future of Europe, for sure, there are discussions being held and there are um, also proposals being put forward. The thing is that what I can state is that when it comes to certain competencies, whether we should go towards a more federal Europe or not, there are divergent views being put forward. So some would call for a more federalist Europe, some would not, some would require um, more competences to be given. Um, and for, for the member state power to be lessened, others not, but to preserve the member state competence. So we really have to see how to put um, also the, these ideas together and these different um, conflicting ideas at times together to ensure that um, we move forward. But the great thing about this exercise is that everyone can participate and we can really listen to the different views. Thank you. Colin, there's a very particular question that you may have seen in the chat, so you've had a time to think about it, from Dermot McCree relating to the present energy crisis and should Ireland now build a BAT nuclear reactor for electricity generation? Uh, can, can you perhaps give some response to that? Certainly. Um, it's a very specific question. All right. I think in, the, in an Irish context, I would say no, in that if the Irish ambition or the recognition that we have enormous capacity in offshore wind I think it's anything from 50 gigawatts up on floating offshore on the West Coast. That's really where our ambition should, should lie. Now, alongside that, there's talk of an interconnector to France. And given that 80% of French energy is produced by nuclear, I don't think we could present ourselves as not using nuclear power. I think we have to be realistic that that probably will be part of our future. But I think as a transition fuel, it has a place. But from Ireland's perspective, there's not much point in investing in a transition to nuclear when we could invest in an ambition to, to, towards offshore wind or, or similar. And I think that's, that's where our ambition should lie, as opposed to going for a, a, a nuclear reactor. And I think certainly the, the combination of offshore renewable energies and also connecting ourselves to the grid more effectively at European level, I think, is, is not, and that's not, I wouldn't be opposed to nuclear in the overall picture. I think we would be hypocritical if we are if we're going to connect to France. But I think in an Irish context, we have other potential and we need to try and harness that potential. Thank you. Now, we have two minutes because then I have to run to give a lecture in another part of this building. So forgive me for being rushed. But I do want to ask this last question of each of you. And if possible, if you could give a brief response. But on the whole, do you think the experiment of these citizens panels in the Conference of Europe has been a success? And do you think it should become institutionalized? It should become a regular feature? And perhaps I'll start with you, Yossian. 
Thank you very much. It's important that we had the, citi the citizens' panels, I believe. But let us remember that throughout our consultations, it's even more important to continue reaching out to citizens, not only those who are on the panels, but even beyond. And this was my message to someone who, in one of the plenaries, a citizen representative in the panels, who also asked a question about how we can make this engagement even stronger. And I asked the citizen representative to help us to reach these citizens. Whether it's effective or not, we stand to be judged, I think, in a, in a few months and even in, in some years. But let's keep the discussion going with our citizens. And yes, let's explore mechanisms and new mechanisms possibly, possibly of how to continue effectively consulting our citizens. Thank you. Colin, I'll ask the same question of you. As I said at the start, I think the, the initiative has had limited success. I think I probably didn't reference the whole COVID scenario, which hasn't helped that situation. But should we continue it? I think absolutely we should continue it. I think it's a, I would feel the nature of Europe and the, like if you look, in many ways, we look to devolve power to local government as much as possible. And like this whole idea of, of a federal Europe and that, that in many ways is centralizing power. So I think definitely power that can bring, when you can bring communication back down to the people, it's very important. I think an initiative like this, it'll be over before people will have bought into it. So I think that the idea of having it on a continuous basis, the idea of doing it digitally at one level is very important, but the point was already made that I think we need to make sure that everybody's included. So I would be for this, Sometimes when something like this is over, people will think, oh, I should have got involved. And I think if it comes again and there's another opportunity, the more we do it, the more people will engage with it. And I think that's that's the idea here, that we this is only a first attempt at it. It's been in a COVID pandemic. We absolutely need to continue to do this because of the nature of Europe and because of the nature of, of discourse at this stage having become somewhat disconnected or, or certainly people's opinions aren't challenged enough. And maybe in this format, we can challenge opinions more. Thank you. And I give the last word to Laurence. Thank you. I think we'll see in a few weeks if it's a success or not. But nowadays, we can say that it's a success in terms of events and of participation, because uh, it's an innovative um, exercise. So it's very interesting because we have this plat online platform. We have a lot of participation, even though we need uh, more women, for example, because uh, we have a very low rate of women participating, but it's a beginning. We have as well this new format of discussion with citizens, but as well with the three institutions, with the members of the national uh, parliaments and with the uh, Comité des Régions, region of, uh, Committee of Region. It's, very, it's new to have this, an exchange at this level. And um, exchanges and talking uh, with the regional elected people is really interesting for Europe. So it's new and I think it, it has to go further. So I answer to your second part, the second part of the question, has it to, to be repeated and uh, institutionalized? I think so, of course, because we need to, um, to give this discussion a follow up. It, we, we can stop now. There are too many things that are changing in many ways. So uh, we'll see which, what will be the results in a few weeks. And then I think we have to, to, to go further, of course. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to, on behalf of everyone who is in this webinar, uh, thank our three uh, excellent panelists, fascinating presentations and discussion, and Colin Markey, Laurence Fereng, and Josiane Kutajar. Thank you for your time. Thank you everyone for your questions. And let's hope that this panel this weekend proves to be the success we all want it to be. Thank you.